Diane DeSanto is with Senator uh, Begich's office in Washington, D.C. He is from Alaska. She is not. <laughs> But I think I've lived there most of my, you know, adult I, life. So. <laughs> so, but I think it's um, really, really wonderful to have her come back to the school. She is an alumna, and actually, I learned about her because a very good friend of mine, uh, Pat Bouillon, who was a chief of staff, I guess, for Senator uh, Danny Noe, said to me, "You need to connect." And he writes these very short emails. Smile. Two <laughs> Smile. And said, alumna. <laughs> you know, so, so then said, you know, you really should call her and get to know her. So I was really delighted to hear that she was in D.C. And delighted to know that she had been there, you know, for more than two years, which sometimes seems to be the lifespan of some of the interns who go there and, you know, the uh, individuals who wish to be in the Washington scene. But she's been there for longer than that and is, in fact, a senior member of the senator's team. So uh, we are lucky to have her. She, in fact, spoke to our students when they visited Washington, D.C. And people came back and said, oh, we're so glad. And Stacy came back and said, oh, she's really good. So <laughs> thought, okay, so we're going to bring her to the school. And we wanted her to have the experience of going to the old school in hmm. the 13th seeing what it has now become. I don't know if you've gone inside. I didn't. Oh, you did I just, no. Yeah. Yeah. I have memories of squished basement and, yeah. you know. Water dripping on you. Just, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Looking beyond the pillars and around the pillars. <laughs> it was uh, pretty much like a war zone. It was pretty tough. But um, people have really fond memories of wherever they are, whether it's the mansion, 113, and now here. So... People come back after they've graduated, sometimes for months after they've graduated. But we're pleased to have Diane come back uh, for the first time in a number of years. And she has a lot that she can share with you. So, Diane. Well, Dean, I really thank you for the opportunity. I, um, I mean, if we didn't, if Pat, you know how it just works, and, and uh, if Pat didn't connect, I mean, you know, you go on with life, and you know, yeah. you give a little money, show his, you know, to your alum, but other than that, you know, you just move on. And um, I just have to say that Pat De Leon has been um, amazing. I miss him a lot. He was chief of staff for Senator Inouye from Hawaii for many years, and um, Senator in a way is so missed, and a lot because his son is a social worker, right? Is he? I think Pat told me yeah. that's yeah. That's why Pat's there's Pat's son is a Pat's social son's worker. a social worker. Yeah, Senator Inouye's son is a musician. Right, that's right. <laughs> but I, I, you know, but he has this. He yeah. had this heart that um, any legislation for social work. I mean, he was he was just kind of the, no one would question him. Him and of course Senator. Kennedy and both are gone and now Senator Harkin is going to be leaving oh. and there um, is not really a champion right now who um, who understands I mean my my boss is in leadership but he's only there I'm I'm in uh, DC five years now I came with him um, he um, he's got a lot going on he's not on he's on appropriations and I'll talk about committees but he's not on uh, labor help so um, you know, we still need to keep looking for that champion, and um, we we miss uh, Senator Kaka too. I mean, there's some of the old um, guard who actually um, I don't know what happened, but there's like a new. I I was just at the very um, got there right when they were all still there, and I see a difference in oh, my yeah. short time, and you must see it from Huge. the Clinton administration. Huge. I mean, it's I, and I'll I'll give you an example, um, and I'm you know I'm completely. Um, this is pretty open, so and I go back and forth. So if I forget some, remind me. Um, so right now, if you turn on C-SPAN, you'll see Senator Ted Cruz from uh, Texas, and he's attempting um, a fake filibuster, which is basically holding the the, um, the Senate ransom. I mean, you know, because then uh, you know we can't vote for what they call cloture, so we can get on with you know funding the government. You and if you want to explain cloture, because that's something that not everybody okay. understands. It's basically to end debate yeah. so they can vote on a motion to proceed right. to the vote. 
So there's a lot of votes going on here. And, and unfortunately, one of the things is that you need the um, 60 votes to get anything done. And it's really hard. You know, maybe at a, I don't know, almost 10,000 um, or more legislation that's introduced every two years, maybe 5% of it ever gets passed. And I think the framers of the Constitution did that so you can weed out. And speaking of the Constitution, I have a little swag for people, but you have to work for it. Yes. I need a new one, my current one. And they're one. little ones. And so, um, Those are nice ones. Mark Begich. And I know you two got to meet him, and he's yeah. uh, he's pretty amazing. I follow his Facebook feed. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's all you know. It's all about salmon, and you know, it's just crazy. Oh, he's always that. off about you know he's he's bugging Domino's Pizza, or you yeah, know. Sure. I have more. Oh. Did you? Yeah, we're, we're, we're short by a couple. Oh. So, the, so, so oh, Ted Cruz is um, trying to you know, keep it going, keep the debate going. If you followed what happened in the Texas legislature, in the state Texas legislature, there was um, a state senator named Wendy Davis. Mm -hmm. And she was, um, she was doing a real filibuster. Their rules, mm -hmm. she couldn't go to the bathroom, she couldn't drink water. She had to stay what they call on, on topic, germane to, to the abortion bill that they were talking about. There wasn't, um, she, it, was, it was a really hard thing to do. What he's doing is um, he gets up and he reads from, you know, Dr. Seuss. That's what he was doing last night when we were watching. Or, you know, he just goes off. He's talking about Hitler. And then every once in a while he goes, he leaves when, it, you know, um, Senator Lee will talk for a little while, Senator uh, Rand Paul, and then um, he'll come back. So it's not, it's not really what the old days, like the Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Yeah. You know, it's, um, so, but it's history and it's worth looking at, you know, especially because you're interested in what's going on there. I mean, I would turn it on once in a while. At one today, the leader, um, Reed, is going to stop his uh, filibuster for a little while, and they're going to vote to stop debate. And I, I think they have enough votes because people want to just get on. The government's going to shut down, you know. And and it's uh, you work with people like if you you know out in the field. I mean, there are people who um, need the services, you know. Be, besides the people who need their paychecks, you know, federal employees are not bad people, you know, and they need their their paychecks. So. Uh, Monday, we may be shut down. We may not. We we just we we just don't know. I mean, where the the offices and the state agencies um, are making contingency plans. And I know you had a speaker last night, and that who works for the department. Or? No, he used to John okay. Callahan. He was um, assistant secretary for management and budget in HHS years ago. So I think he's a lobbyist now. Okay. Yeah. But he didn't go too much into the legislative piece. Okay. That's good because I'm not up on the budget as much as, uh, it's okay. you know, it's, yeah. um, it's a complicated, Very. there's budget and then there's appropriations. Right. And my, my boss is on appropriations. Right. Um, so what I would like to do is, um, here, I'd like your names and, are you in placements now? Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So why don't we start with you? So hi, my name is Ashley Stewart. I'm a second year student in the AGPP track, and my uh, field placement is at John Jay College of Criminal Justice, working with their Sikh department. The Sikh department, mm -hmm. really? Yeah. You know they had, and then um, is this on like hate crimes or like what? Uh, no, we're working with undergraduate students. We're doing groups for students who fell or who are on academic probation to try oh. and increase their academic support. You and I are thinking the same thing. We had an incident with this oh, right. Trump project yeah, professor. Yeah. 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 So, C, is it S E E K? Yes. Oh, I. Oh. <laughs> Not S I K H. Oh. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, that's what I was trying to figure out. Like, what is this? Okay. That's it. Um, so, my name is Sindel, and I'm also. How do you spell Sindel? C I N D I L. What a cool name. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's Lakota. Um, so I am also a second year, I'm on the policy track, and my placement is at the Earth Institute. I'm working with the One Million Community Health Workers campaign, 
to scale up community health workers in Africa for the end, the tail end of the Millennium Development Goals. So that's why you go to Columbia. Where else can you get these placements? This is amazing. I'm Rose, um, second year in policy. Right now, I'm helping on at the Pop Center with a, an evaluation on. Um, a, like a Teach for America for child welfare workers called Children's Corps, and there's an, um, I'm on the evaluation team. And then in the spring, I'm, it looks like I'm going to be at the Center for Budget and Policy Priorities oh. at their Family Income Security Unit, I believe. So um, um, Dr. Walvogel, who's here, has a colleague um, who runs that unit. So that looks like where, uh, what I'll be doing in D.C. They're, they're really good people. They they pump us a lot of great information. So I've heard really be... good things. And I'm on their email list serve now just to sort of, and there's a lot, they're doing a lot of work around the, the SNAP bill, especially. Yeah. You want to tell people what SNAP is? Oh, just... but they don't know. Oh, come yeah, on. Yeah. Know. You guys are so sick in here, social work yeah, students. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's the Supplemental right. Nutrition Assistance Program, which That's used right. to be called Food Stamps. Food stamps. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, hi, my name's Wenbin. Uh, What's your name? Tell me again. W E N B I N. Mm. I'm China, and uh, I'm, I'm a second year student on, po on policy track also. And I'm sorry that I don't have a placement uh, this me uh, until next semester full time, I think. I believe that I'm going to work in, in OECD in France. Uh, I'm not sure the exact assignment yet, but definitely going to be like policy like research stuff. Sure. Hey, I'm Amy, yes, and I am not currently in a field placement, but I'm going to be in Congressman Levin's office in the spring, so I will see you around the hill. Oh. <laughs> That's the house side. Yes. The people it's not, side. It's not too far away. The lower but. house. The lower house. It's true. Sen, it's really snotty. <laughs> you know. But I'll, I'll walk, I, I actually walk over once in a while, which unlike most Senate staffers. <laughs> well, they they, right? They won't go yeah, over there. They take the train and, you know, Yeah, they won't. <laughs> and it's like, oh, it's on the house. They have great briefings on the house. And they're like, oh, it's on the house. Oh, I don't want to go. <laughs> <laughs> you need good shoes, though. <laughs> yes. It's not an easy walk. But, yeah, a lot of young people still wearing those big high heels, you know, to walk around. It looks great. Hi, I'm Katie Cahill. I am an advanced standing student, which means this is my first year, but I'm in second year courses. And my placement is at the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in the Bureau of Substance Use and Alcohol Care Prevention and Treatment. So, uh, working on a bunch of different initiatives. I was in advanced standing. Oh, great. Yeah, and I was talking to Stacy last night about this. There's pros and cons to it. It's fast. That's it <laughs> already is, it feels and, fast. You know, and I, I feel like I, I missed out on um, a, like a liberal arts education by getting a BSW, although, you know, it was, it was a great thing to have. It's like this, the balance and then not having the two years it was a little cheaper, but it was still, you know, I yeah. can't imagine what yeah. it is now. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Gabriel. I actually am a BSW, but chose not to do the advanced standing. Um, and I think it was a great decision. Um, <laughs> financially, not so much. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but um, I do agree that I really did like that um, liberal arts education, because I, I double majored and was able to do some other stuff. But um, I'm a second year right now, and I am a law minor also. And I am in Columbia Presbyterian in the cardiac unit. Oh. So you're doing the dual? The no. No, I'm okay. it, a law minor is like something. Just the, the just minor, but not the dual. Yeah. But I have decided that I do want to go to law school. So, um, oh, awesome. I know, I decided like two weeks ago. Though. <laughs> <laughs> After I got into a law class, I was like, I really like this, and this is what I really love doing, and I really want to work with social work and law. And well, I had uh, my mentor, my social work mentor, was a, a professor, and um, her name was Pudge Kleinkoff, and... Um, she um, she retired like at 50 and um, from teaching, and she went and got her law degree because she felt like she wasn't listened to. It was very interesting, you know. When you're um, she was doing more state, um, trying to get you know um, state policies passed, and so she went to um, Puget Sound and got her law degree. And she decided right now she's like world famous fly fishing person. 
Like she found her passion. Like she did. She didn't really do the law after that. <laughs> she goes all around the world, and she um, so she uses her social work, right? So she um, does things like in the battered woman shelter, she'll take out women, and because right, it really builds self-esteem. Mm -hmm. Like you take them out in the wilderness and teach them fly fishing so and all. Cool. So I mean, that just yeah. here's somebody with a a path that you know you just never know. Yeah. So she did, but she saw that, you know, she wasn't being listened to as a woman. I mean, maybe a male social worker is different, but as, as a woman, it's a little different. So. Well, you have great placements. and um, You know, I have to say that I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, pretty poor. And um, coming to Manhattan was like maybe once a year you come to Macy's to see Santa Claus. But... Um, but Columbia University was always in the movies, and everyone talks about going to Columbia. So it was, oh, I always, always thought in the back of my mind, you know, that, and I always thought I would do some kind of um, social work or some helping people. Um, and so when the and so when I moved to Alaska, when um, basically I, I was at Woodstock and I left Woodstock. It's the truth. I like went to Woodstock, went to the West Coast, and never came back. <laughs> I found, you know, peace and love and whatever. You know. And then, um, so it's it's really the the truth, you know. And then, um, so Alaska did not have an MSW program, but um, you know, having a BSW, um, we we um, advocated for many years, and we did get we did get one, um, and we did it by um, a lot of different paths. And one is the um, for the Alaska natives out in the rural areas, they just didn't have any, um, then it was very hard to recruit anybody to go out there. So we thought if we homegrown by having a having school of social work and we um, worked really, really hard. And, the, and there's, so the sad part about what we did is we negotiated um, and we sold out in a way. We negotiated with the the chancellor at the time and said, okay, we really want this program, so social workers will pay a professional fee, right, on, you know, like, so they paid 50% more than anyone else so we could get this program because you had to be self-sustaining. Mm -hmm. And you're just starting out, you're not, you know, there weren't scholarships, it was really hard. We did get money from what we call the Mental Health Trust, which is a, um, a settlement um, that you may want to look up because it's it's complicated, but it was a settlement that mentally ill um, people were not um, the land was being sold for minerals, and then the mentally ill people were not getting any of the the money, including the community health centers, the community mental health centers. So the mental health trust saw value in a, a MSW program, so they put in money. And then we had all the tribes saying, yeah, we really need this, we need to homegrown. But doing that, that um, professional fee, it was really hard to get rid of it. And as you know, when you come out of a program and you're maybe just going into, um, into direct practice, you're not making much money. Right? So um, they eventually, what happened was we found out there was another new master's program and they weren't, and I think it was engineering, and they weren't paying professional fees. So, you know, us as advocates, because that's what we <coughs> learn, right? We just, you know, we, we pounded the regents. We were at every meeting. We were just constantly like, this is not, this isn't the agreement. You know, but we, we, um, we learned a lot, put things in writing, <laughs> you know, and, um, be careful what you, you ask for because it's, it, so we did, we did finally um, get rid of that. And I, you know, I tell you all this because it is, it is policy. It is like you find policy is directed, it's, it's directed by practice, you know. And um, I, I work with very young people. And, you know, I mean, that the Hill is, I'm, I'm very, Pat and I were kind of one of, the few oldies and yeah. the, you know, that's why I have, oh, here's my card. That's why I have senior, you know, it's like, you know, <laughs> senior, you know. Um, and that, so for the younger people, they, they, their track is, you know, they just want to go work on the hill. So they, a lot of them graduate from um, GW, from the policy school, or, you know, they just, um, and they want to be on the hill and they, they are great policy wonks, but they really just want to be on their computer. 
when you guys met the senator at that coffee, they hate, my colleagues hate doing those coffees. The coffees, the constituent coffees, because he can't see everyone, every senator can't see every constituent. So once a week he has what they call a coffee and then all the constituents are in, who are coming through uh, Washington come in um, and meet him. And they groan about, oh God, you know, they have to, and I'm just so excited because I get to see Alaskans and I get to see, because I don't get a lot of lobbyists coming to see me. You know, like some of the, you know, my colleagues. You know, and, and so they, um, so they, the, my colleagues love the piece of just, you know, walking and the research and the Senate will walk into um, the office and say, ask a question like, what's the percentage of so-and-so, you know, and then before I can open my mouth and it's something I'm supposed to be answering, they'd be on like Google and, it, you know, and so it's a different, it's a generational thing, but I, I really believe that um, when it comes down to it, one, not having the, the community engagement, not knowing people in the community, and then not knowing what you're, um, what you're writing laws about, you know, so you can listen to the lobbyists when they come in, who, who I do listen to, because they're the experts. They're like the guy from Budget who worked, you know, there's you know, they're not all sleazy. I mean, they're actually people who uh, want to make a difference and just get paid a lot more than us. You know, so, um, you know, I would never, you know, it's just that, like, in mental health, um, I work really closely with, um, do you know Al Guida? He's been around forever. Oh. He's the lobbyist for the National Council on Behavioral Health. Oh, okay. No, and he's been doing it, like, 30 years, uh -huh. you know. And his, they become subject matter experts, don't you think? Yes. Yeah. 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 And I and um, so you get so I remember when we first started and we'd be sitting around our conference room, and there's lobbyists that came in, and then I'm a legislative assistant, and then there's legislative correspondents who are kind of the people who write the letters and kind of assist us. And um, so we were having, and then I had a couple of interns, and these lobbyists came in, and um, we were talking about um, veterans issues. And I was asking a lot of questions, and then later on they said, why do you ask so many questions? And I thought, do you actually know everything? Like, could you actually know everything they were talking about? Sometimes asking questions is seen as a sign of weakness. And, you know, I, I, just, I just can't believe that, but it's like seen as, you know, because you want to you wanna know everything, but it's impossible to know everything. And the great Senator Inouye, he was speaking at um, a public health conference, and Pat took me with him, and I'm listening. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe he said that. And so I'm going, walking back with him, and I said, oh, Senator Inouye, I just like, that was great what you said. I think he mentioned social work too, you know. And I just, you know, you said this and that, and then he said, young lady, I've been in the Senate 40 years. You think I know everything? <laughs> and I'll never forget that because yeah. here is the the king of the Senate, and he says like he learns something every day, and I try and I try to do that too. So you know I can I can tell you stuff today, but I I've only been there five years, <coughs> and it it is um, and in, it, it's just rules and rules and laws and statutes, and that's a really good point actually. Mastery of Congress is oftentimes mastery of the rules, right? Because what you can do and the strategies that are available are only available if you know what they are and how to use them. And sometimes sequencing them or linking them or, or whatever. Don't you agree? Yeah. yeah. Like putting, you know, we have a couple of bills and we are trying to get them passed, but we can't get them passed, so you have to know what legislation is coming down and can you put that on, like put it on and what's the best timing for it. Right. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions about my little rant about the policy and the direct practice? I'm not saying, you know, you have to go out and start working with clients, but I'm saying that you can at least volunteer and know what you, the people that you're going to be making laws for and making policy for, you know, talk to them. They're the ones who know. You know, or for or the the people who are working in the field. 
Do you get a chance to go back to Alaska to work with constituents more directly, or is it really just the experience you get with constituents that come to D.C.? I go back a lot, and before sequestration, which remind me and I'll talk about it, I went back every recess. I just spent a month there. I'm, you know, I'm still a resident. And, is that um, typical, or do you take a special effort to? I probably go time? more than the rest of them. Um, I actually moved my mother there from Brooklyn, New York. I mean, you know, so it's like, um, but I mean, that's that's my home, and um, I have. Um, I mean, that's I all my connections are there, and I just I miss not being in the community. You know, I sometimes I just die when I don't get to, you know, be out there. It's a very, you know, the job's been difficult as far as that insular mm -hmm. little world. You know, this Ted Cruz thing, I would say 90% of America doesn't even know what's going on right. and how it's affecting us. So baggage has a very important role in appropriations, and that's how I think you got to know Pat, because the senator prior to becoming president pro tem was actually chair of co-chair chair of appropriations. So um, last night, John Callahan talked about the process of developing a proposal that actually the president's budget goes to Congress, and that's what ultimately, after all these passbacks between uh, the departments and OMB and so on, what happens then is it goes over to Congress. And one of the things that I've said, Diane, is you know, oftentimes people look at laws and think that the laws themselves are what make for programs and policy directions. When in actuality, it's really a combination of things. It's the laws, but it's also whether it's funded, okay? So the appropriations um, uh, phenomenon and process <coughs> is probably the most important thing you could learn besides the rules which, what was his name? He was the uh, Grand Master of Rules in, in the Senate. Byrd? Yeah, Senator Byrd. I mean, he knew, he was the expert, right? He knew when to move things, when not to move things, and all of the nuances and subtleties. But beyond knowing the rules, the other thing that is really, really useful to know is the approach process. So once the President's budget comes over, it goes to various subcommittees. They're all working on it and looking at it, et cetera. But can you talk about that all the way through to, you know, actually the passage of the budget? Because sure. that is that other piece of policy making that most people are totally unaware of. I actually took it. I actually have the sub, here they are, because I, I always forget the subcommittees for um, approps. Because my boss is not on the help, um, help yeah. one, but... Um, yeah. That doesn't mean we can't because he's on a probes. You know. Isn't Mikulski? She's the chair, she's and she's sure also a social worker. That's yes. right. Really? She so is amazing. Yeah, yeah. She, is, she is really able to. She's the senator from uh, Maryland, Maryland, and she's the longest sitting female senator. Right. And she has um, really done a great job, mm -hmm. a great job being appropriations chair. Um, she's really that, that social work skill and negotiation, which is not something the Senate does very well. Mm -hmm. She's very respectful. Right. She lets them, you know, the other side talk as much as they want. Mm -hmm. But she's direct, you know, and I think we'll, we'll get something. We haven't really got many uh, appropriation bills out know. there. You know. I think what I'll do is I'll explain a bill that I've been, um, that's really close to my heart that I've been working on and how the two pieces, authorizing and then appropriations. That would be really good. Yeah. So we, um, there's a bill called Mental Health First Aid, and um, and I don't remember the number of it, but if you look it up, it's Senator Begich's bill. And uh, he introduced it um, about two years ago after um, the Aurora killing, I think. Yeah, the, I think it was Aurora. It was one of the, and it was only going to be high, it was the Mental Health First Aid of Higher Education Act. And it basically, it's like CPR for the lay person, but only for mental health. So it's like if you were the receptionist downstairs or the guard downstairs, you take this course and you kind of know that, you know, that student was coming in every day, had like wide eyes and was kind of, you know, acting bizarre, just, you know, 
and they would be able to somehow um, flag it, not do any treatment, but flag it, and then do some follow-up. So it's very basic, mental health first aid. And so um, I, I knew about it because the University of Alaska has been teaching it just, you know, kind of on its own and some, uh, a number of other states. But we knew that, wow, this is like a prevention thing. So I worked with the, um, the lobbyists for the uh, Behavioral Health, um, National Council for Behavioral Health, which all the, all the mental health centers around the country are part of this. And um, because they, they own mental health first aid, they actually own the, the curriculum. And so we wrote a bill. The best, one of the best parts about working for Congress is that legislative council. They are amazing. I just come up with these ideas, like I do not know how to write bills, and right. anybody who says they write right. bills, you know, you just, I'll give you other examples later, but you know, so I would just write them and say, my boss wants to, um, introduce this bill training program, you know, and um, for mental health first aid, blah, blah. I mean, that's about it. It was about this much. And they run with it. The and they come back with a beautiful looking bill. Right? And oh, and I, what, the one thing I did have to find is where in the SAMHSA substance abuse mental health services, where in that the Public Health Act and in SAMHSA, it's authorized because we are um, what they call it a, tell me if I'm going like too fast and scattered because, okay. So there's a thing called a pay for right now um, where you can't just come up with a new idea. You actually have to figure out who's going to pay for it. Mm -hmm. How's it going to be paid for? Right. Mm -hmm. I either have to say, well, let's cut this, which I do a lot of. I'm always like, well, why don't we cut this building out? Or why don't we cut these tanks out or, you know. <laughs> You know, so I do try, but so we found something in the Public Health Act, and then um, so SAMHSA had this thing, and it was just um, a training. It was just basically mental health training, you know. But it wasn't. Um, it was authorized, like it was already in there, but it wasn't funded. Mm -hmm. right? So we um, got the bill written, found that piece, right? So we have that in in Senator Harkin's committee, put it in there. And then um, in appropriations, we had to keep fighting for the money. And we originally had asked for $25 million mm -hmm. because that's what. That's not a lot. No, yeah. no. And, but that's what was in there that wasn't right. being spent. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I have to say I wasn't, like, the only one. It's like, oh, I found it. I mean, I, you know, I worked, you work with a lot of people to find it. Because mm -hmm. It's pretty complicated looking through the, um, the, the appropriations and the budgets and trying to find money. Uh, so, we, so from 25, um, it was appropriated. The White House really liked it, and it's part of their big mental health package. Um, but when the appropriations, when it got into appropriations, um, they um, put it down to 20, and we came out. So then I went and presented with um, Senator Ayotte as the Republican co-sponsor. Mm -hmm. You always want to get a Republican, mm -hmm. you know. And so, and it's all about relationships with any of your jobs. And for me, um, some reason that Senator Ayotte's office, because they're both youngest, they're young, mm -hmm. so they're both like in their 40s, my boss and her. So you just try to find somebody that they're compatible. She's very right wing. He's not, but there's certain things you find that you agree on. So, um, and then I got to know her staff, who does the same thing I do. And I go, you know, wanted to do this bill with me. And um, New Hampshire teaches for mental health first aid. What we did was we called the, we called the mental health people in each of our states and said, hey, call, call us and say you want to do this. You know, because like, you want, you know, that's what you do. You yeah. influence this, you know. And... Um, so they, so then she's like, oh, yeah, I'm getting all these calls, yeah. So then we have, with both of us, Dan and I go to, in front of um, the, um, the authorizing committee, Senator Harkin's committee, not the committee, but their staff. So it's like 20 or 30 staff, and we present the bill. And then they ask us questions. And then they actually recommended $15 million, even though, you know, because they had 
a big package because by then there was Newtown, there was a lot more, you know, mental health type killings that were going on. They weren't even talking about the 9,000 that happened after Newtown. It was just like the big ones. So then we finish with that and then we have Senator Mikulski's, right? So it's in there. It's in the president's budget, right? So there's, so you're getting the picture. It's like you you're have a lot census. of, yeah. you have a lot of work to do with, you know, it's not just like, oh, you passed the bill. So the, the president and the vice president did this big mental health summit. They talked about mental health first aid. Mm -hmm. They actually would wanted more money in it, but I don't think it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. you know? So we have the president's support. We have everyone's support on this. And now what they decided to do, unfortunately, is they put it in the mental health gun package. Mm -hmm. So that's the package that went 95 to 2, but then we couldn't get it passed. Um, so, but so, Diane, there was a deliberate reason for putting it in there, don't you think? Mm -hmm. You want to talk about that? Well, because the background check, because of the gun, well, one piece is they were hoping to get the background checks and yeah. get some of the gun, gun legislation passed, and they thought if they did it all in one bundle. So, um, for disclosure, my boss is, is totally into, you know, the Second Amendment rights. He's like, you know, it's all about... Alaskans need to have guns. But he also had a bill for background checks. Um, so the Newtown um, Sandy Hook Promise has been coming to talk to my boss and Gifford's group and the mayors against guns. And I have not been in any of those meetings because they're all gun oriented. And then my boss is like, I think I need you in them because um, it's, it was just getting very tense. I mean, these are moms who lost their kids, and he's right. talking guns, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I've been meeting with them, and um, they yesterday I met with them, and they are really pushing for the full, they're separating. We're trying to separate the guns mm -hmm. right now from the mental health package. Mm -hmm. And I tried to, I, you know, like I was talking to the Giffords people, and I'm trying to talk to them about it. I said, my friends in mental health are dying right now. They need, there's been no funding. It's been not even level. Yeah. They've been cuts and cuts of mental health and substance abuse. You know, they can't, the VA, I mean, they've hired more mental health practitioners, but it's still been difficult. So can you just look at the package and not, and deal with the guns? Mm -hmm. But that's their carrot. So like, no, no, we're not going to do it. So we, yesterday when I was talking to the Newtown people, and um, said, well, my boss wants to hotline. So hotline is um, when you basically, you don't do a vote. It's all like done in, in private, and you just need the two parties to agree. Hotlines happen all the time for mostly like resolutions. Like, you know, today is talk like a pirate day resolution, and they just, you know, It'll say something, it'll go like, um, you want to in a hotline this. So we, um, we are, this, our plan is to just move our bill, our little bill out of this big, beautiful mental health package, which is a great bill that, um, and I'll tell you the number in that because I love that. It's S689, a Senator Harkin's bill. So mental health first aid is in that package. My bill, Senator's bill is S-153. So, so the plan right now is, um, we think we may have most votes because our, the mental health first aid bill is very bipartisan. And we have like Senator Blount, Senator Rubio, you yeah. know, we have people who usually don't get on these bills. But, and um, I think that, um, We'd like to think it would go, but we have Senator, so Senator Coburn, who usually, um, they call him Dr. No. Mm -hmm. So he says no to everything. It's very rare he'll hotline something. But this may be a concession. So it looks like they're doing <coughs> something about guns. But the Democrats may not like it, because what will happen is that um, it will get Passed and it'll be like, okay, we did some. The Republicans will now say, 
okay, we did something, not, they're not going to get anything else done with the guns. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we're not getting a lot of support from the big groups, you know, Mayors Against Guns and some other ones, to hotline because they really want the full gun package. Yeah. So, um, but, the, but the, the vice president and the president want to see something. And um, so my boss actually, he's in leadership. There's five um, in leadership in the Democratic Party and then in the Republican Party. So he's the fifth. So he gets called all the time. He goes over there, and they, and he's also running. So he's up in 2014, and they want to keep him in the Senate. So I'm being, I'm not being Pollyanna about it, but it's like, why can't, why aren't we passing this thing? It's so simple. It's so cheap, mm -hmm. and it can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Maybe like the Navy Yard killing. Maybe if that hotel clerk. Or the cop, the Rhode Island cop, had training. You know, I'm not saying this is the end all of going to change the world, but maybe if they saw the signs, instead of saying, you're hearing voices, stay in your room, you know, they'd say, geez, we, we need to maybe get him in, you know, do, um, even though he was, they said he wasn't and harmed himself or others, like really try to do an evaluation. Let me ask about an alternative, okay, and I, I don't know whether this would work or not, but is there um, authorizing language for one of the HHS departments, say, uh, not departments, agencies like SAMHSA, that would permit you all to take one of the titles, particularly a title having to do with training or research, and in the appropriations process, fund one of those titles with a demonstration doing exactly this without the legislation. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then leaving it to the discretion of the secretary to do the distribution. So, you know, you wouldn't even have to mention faith-based, but you could say that, uh, you know, this the funds would be uh, allocated on a pilot basis to states that have an interest in blah, blah, blah. What, I mean, what about that as a possibility? Well, it, sa it kind of says that. I yeah. mean, you know. No, no, um, but I mean, if you can't get the bill through, can you do it just through a probes is what I'm saying. Well, that's, that's our second piece okay. if we can't. Right. Okay, okay. Because it's already, a pro you know, it's already in there. Right. So that would be our second part. So he's also, the center is also having a discussion with, um, with Chair Mikulski right. um, and Alexander. But I, um, it, it may be a little harder because we haven't gotten anything through. No, I know, I know, I know. But I'm just thinking, you know, if the bill just goes down, you know, what are then the options right. that you have to play, right? Yeah, that's and what we're... When money, and when monies were there, you could do that, and Harkin was a master, and actually Specter was a master at doing that, of finding some line item within somebody's approach budget that they would put some monies in and say there's going to be a pilot program to do the following, right. you know. So, I mean, again, I don't know. There may be no monies to give. but Well, you remember you were around during what we call earmarks. Yeah. And um, in Alaska, really, we really need the small states like Hawaii and Alaska. Right. We need earmarks, and that's that's basically taking money. You know what earmarks are, yeah. and um, specific for something for your state. And our Alaska was built on earmarks. Um, Senator Stevens um, and Senator Inouye. I mean, they're the two. They're the you know the states that the youngest states, and they weren't, they were, no one was paying attention to them. But they had senior members, you know, and so they, they basically said, you know, we put in these la this language, these demonstration grants, exactly. and, and all over Alaska, there's just projects from earmarks. And then um, two years ago, three years ago, they got rid of earmarks, right. and um, it's been really difficult for, us, like, social services you know, for any of the stuff that you work on, for the agencies to get um, get funding for projects. 
to get funding for their, you know, for buildings, to get funding for their clients since there's no earmarks. Yeah. Small states really suffer and um, the Hawaii delegation, are fr they are like the, uh, they're so new and it's very difficult right now for Hawaii to get anything. But we made a pledge because, you know, Senate Inouye and Akaka were there for Alaska all those years. They were, and Senate, they were, they were, with brothers and sisters, the two um, states, and um, so Senator Begich was was with Senator Hirano and Schatz. It was like, you know, we'll be here for you as much as we can, mm -hmm. you know, because there's no earmarks. But I know, I know. Yeah, there's no way to use that. I mean, not just for a state, but you know, for a national kind of thing. No, it's it's getting more more difficult, and um, and it's hard, you know, because of the partisanship. It's yeah. it's. Um, difficult to um, get anything to get Senator Alexander to agree to anything. He's the co-chair of, um, of, of the ranking member of um, appropriation. So so that's like the, the mental health first aid bill is, an, is just one example. I'll give you another one of one that worked without going through um, going through the appropriations. So I so first, I have to tell you what I do, because you probably don't know what I do. Okay. So I'll give you a little bit about my background. So I, I started out um, working in child welfare, and then um, in mental health, and then uh, work with tribes, just a whole different group. And then um, I, I volunteered a lot for campaigns. I volunteered. I was a, a social activist, so usually around women's issues, or you know. So I was kind of you know out there, and um, so. Um, an opportunity came up to work for then Governor Knowles. He was elected. He's a Democrat from Alaska, and um, and I became a special assistant and then um, or a, um, a community coordinator for the state and um, within the Department of Health and Social Services. So um, worked directly for the commissioner, and then. Um, after that, so I was there for eight years. I was also the chair of the the um, social work licensing board at this at the same time, um, and I was also on NESW. So, how many of you are NESW members? You get prizes. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what I have for you. I have some prizes here. Do any of you have kids? Because oh, I have a kid's thing. Oh, I live with a seventeen. I live with a seventeen. Who's, who's NESW? Not me. I haven't paid the fee yet. Well, you, you gotta pay, pay before you become. I, I know. Yeah. 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 It's cheaper when you, you go. Can you give that to Amy? I'll give. You, I'll give everybody. I just. Something. I don't know which chapter to join. That's my problem. Here, you can have this for the seventeen. Connecticut, New York, D.C., Virginia. Puerto Rico? Here's the here's this for the little. Right now I'm in Missouri. This activity book for the, uh, Congress. For oh, little kids. Cool. I'm cool. always around kitties, so. Mm -hmm. So I, so I asked you about Annie S W because um, I mean that was like my um, that was a great segue mm -hmm. like into policy. I was um, elected as the delegate assembly person for many years. I would keep going, and that was the delegate assembly for National Association of Social Workers. It's basically the policy making body. Mm -hmm. At, they don't. They, I think they do it all by, um, yep. right, they don't, or yeah, it used to be you'd go and you'd argue and, you know, and I'd be there like from Alaska, be two of us and they'd be like, no guns, they're putting that in their policy and we'd be like, you know, you can't have a blanket statement about guns because, you know, we have hunting, it's like no guns, you know. And they went, I think I, when I was there, we were doing the, co um, the new code of ethics and fighting that. We fought a lot about BSW and their inclusion into um, NASW. It's a great, NASW is a, a great way to um, really understand the process at a mini le level all the way up. Um, just, and, and I also feel it's your obligation as social workers and it's, you know, a little cheaper now while you're still students to be part of your professional organization. I know they go through they're always going through changes with executive directors and, you know, but it's pretty easy for you to get on your boards, you know. I wouldn't think it's, it seems like they're always looking for people to to run and it's a good way to you, for you to begin that. 
So I was um, on working with the NASW for a long time, and then um, and then I then um, I worked on then Mayor Begich's campaign, and um, he ran three times and he won he won the third time, and uh, so then I became a special assistant for him. And I loved being a special assistant because you, you basically have different things all the time. Gangs were big, so then I worked on gangs, or then meth was big, you know, and I do a meth, you know, I was, you, do, you form coalitions, whatever you need to do to get the community involved. So that's why I know so much of the community because of that, the mayor's work. So then I thought, okay, well, I know I got to kind of learn state government and then, um, which is a little, you know, state government, you know, you can get things passed if you have a nice, you know, balance. Right now, most states, it's pretty hard to get anything passed because the state, because um, people need to vote. You know, I think they're not, I don't know what it is, but our state, um, our state Senate and houses are not um, real balanced. So it's very, there's some really horrible bills being passed. So then I went into city government and that um, within three weeks sometimes you could get an ordinance passed. It's pretty amazing. Right? And just um, the community comes to you, you know, with a problem and you just, like, you know, come and you go, there's, you know, you go before the city council and then they hear it, you know, you get, you, you bring in the activist and you just pile in you know, the assembly chamber with hundreds of people, you know, if they're going to cut the schools or whatever, you know, and then, you, you know, you have, then they vote. And I thought, well, gee, I, haven't, I haven't experienced federal, the federal piece. So then um, when he was running for Senate against then, like, the most powerful senator, Senator um, Ted Stevens, um, I thought, okay, well, you know, I worked on a campaign. Working on a campaign, you can do whatever. You know, at one point I just wanted to be, I just wanted to be at the front desk so I can say hi to people and, you know, welcome them. Because sometimes campaigns are not very welcoming. And it's like if it's the first time you go going to work on a campaign, you want to have somebody who's like, hey, what do you want to do, you know. Um, and I did, I wrote um, white papers for him on, like, domestic violence or whatever he needed. Um, and we didn't, the, we had the election, it was too close to call, and then... Um, I think almost, so nobody knew what they were doing, right? We didn't know if we were, you know, and I wanted to go to Washington. And then uh, I think about 14 days later, they called the election. He won by about 1,000. Um, and that, um, and then I, we all, a little bunch of us from Alaska moved to Washington, D.C. on January 3rd, 2009. Um, and um, I had no idea what a legislative assistant was. I had no, I didn't know what anything. I just, you know, wanted to work for Mark Baggage because I loved, he did such a great job as mayor. He did a fabulous job. He had all his, his police were trained. Um, they work with NAMI. Okay. Um, that's, that NAMI is the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill, and it's, um, Consumers of mental illness. He worked with them, and they trained every cop in uh, crisis intervention and suicide um, prevention. I mean, he's. I thought he was a great mayor, and I think he misses that. What's, what city? Anchorage. Anchorage. Yeah. Yeah. His and mayor. The governor was Palin. At the time, yes, <laughs> yes. She for a very short time. Yeah, she was governor. We we have like a Palin free zone. We just like people come by and they see when we first came in, they see Alaska. Like, oh, you know, Governor Palin. I'm like, no, <laughs> <laughs> she wasn't governor that long, you know. But she was mayor of Wasilla yeah. when he was mayor. Right. So we did it with some things together, but they didn't even really have a police force. So it was just a small little place. <laughs> and so the le a, a legislative assistant is, a, you know, we. Um, we look at uh, ways to promote the state and to, you know, it's the benefit of the state. So, you know, we're like our own little country and everything is about us, really, you know, which is different than the departments or the committees. So I'm personal staff. I'm not a committee staff. And, I, and, um, and five years later, I still choose to stay within, um, stay with um, 
the center and his personal staff because I just love working with him. And I also want to want to be able to go home to Alaska. Uh, so I have I have many issues. Each legislative assistant has many is issue areas, and um, I had to write him down because I was thinking of them veterans. So he's on the um, Senate Veterans Affairs Committee. So I'm the committee his committee staffer for Veterans Affairs. So if you ever watch C-SPAN and you watch the veterans, I'm always, you see the staff, I'm always sitting behind them there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I have veterans, I have immigration, and the way I split up, so the good thing about being an older staffer mm -hmm. is I basically choose what I have passion for, mm -hmm. um, which I just, you know, I, I can do that because I know him a long time and it's, you know, it's very hard for me at my age to work for things I don't feel passion for. You know, you may not have a choice. You're going to have to do whatever you're told to do. But um, there were some things I was given. It's just like I just, you know, like student loans, no offense. But that was, <laughs> that's a tough one, yeah. you know. And it just was not, it just didn't do it for me. Um, so it, so I do half immigration, so I basically do the refugee and immigrant piece. I don't do the, like, the business visas. Yeah, I know it doesn't make sense, but that, you know. So I worked on the immigration bill also, but we all worked on individual pieces. 744? Yeah, it was S744? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that, that bill, um, Nancy Pelosi is writing a bill and pushing it on the House she side. So maybe yesterday. something will happen mm -hmm. with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She's with, amazing. She's, she's, she she's got to go back into being chair. Oh, I, know. I work on drug policy, affordable housing, all the poverty issues, um, on appropes, the military construction appropriations budget. Wait, so military? Yeah. So each, so there's all these subcommittees. So my boss is on the military veterans construction so that's that's basically all the VA and, and military so that's that's the P, he's on that committee he's on about I think there he's on about four appropriation committees so. um, I do aging which I know you worked yeah, with yeah. you know aging um, Social Security and we actually I'm proud to say we have two Social Security bills. He's a leader in trying to figure out what to do with Social Security and um, one of the bills we worked with the House side and um, the bill is protecting and preserving Social Security. It is um, to, to scrap the cap. Right now in Social Security you, you after you make a hundred 113,700 you don't pay into social security anymore. Mm -hmm. So every year my husband uh, my husband my uh, my uh, remember I was talking about that I uh, rose about yeah. Condoleezza Rice and not yeah saying we when you get into this world the person you work for is like your spouse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, it's like you're with them so much and you're just spend so much time with them, you know. Um so he gets on the Senate floor and he'll say how many of you have looked at your, you know, about September, or the end of September around now, he said, how many of you have looked at your paychecks? And none of them look at their paychecks because they're millionaires. They just don't look it. But his whole point is, if you notice, it's more now because you're not paying any more into Social Security. But poor people are still paying in. Like, you know, you still, and we need to get rid of that so we can make it solvent, so we can keep putting money into it. Um, and the other piece of it is the consumer price index. Mm -hmm. Right now, you, do you hear about chain CPI? Mm -hmm. Chain CPI is this horrible, um, you must know, because uh, Dean, because of the, you're working with the aging community. It's, chain CPI is a way of um, consumer price index where they would take into account things like cars and, and computers. Mm -hmm. My boss is, has one called um, CPIE, so it's elderly, CPI elderly, and it would take into account when you're doing the, um, the cost of living would be things like medication, mm -hmm. doctors, you know, the things that, food, things that, you know, old people and poor people basically, you know. Mm -hmm. And so those are the two main things on, the, on his bill. Um, 
he is being attacked for raising taxes on the rich because you're basically taking that cap off. And so, but he's, you know, it's a it's a great bill. Um, Senator Harkin also has a bill. Senator Harkin's bill is even better, but it's he's actually he's actually um, increasing Social Security up to eight hundred dollars a year. So um, so we got on each other's bill. So whatever, we just want to see something pass. Mm -hmm. You know, I, something has to happen, or you're not going to have Social Security. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think like that's something you may want to get on. The the other Social Security bill is um, is called the Windfall. It's the Social Security, Social Security Fairness Act. It's um, windfall elimination is something you know about that. It's um, for teachers, police, people in um, public service. There's an option where you don't pay into Social Security. You don't have to. Like the state of Alaska, we didn't pay in. Um, and it goes into like a 401k. But, but I also worked and I did my 30 quarters or whatever. So I already put in. But you still get um, penalized. So um, my Social Security check when I start collecting will have up to 40% deduction because of this windfall elimination provision. So we have those two bills. That one's very popular. It's also $80 billion. But if we get the other bill passed, then we'd have money for it. You know? So, those, so that, those are the two Social Security bills. And he, um, the coalitions love him. And they're always like him and Bernie Sanders. They always have him out there. He was on. Um, they're really pushing these bills. Social Security. Um, there's a whole bunch of. Um, coalitions, and when you start working with with that organization, you'll see that they help us a lot with it. Um, Social Security. I work on HIV/AIDS. Um, so for health, we we split up health. So for the Obamacare, ACA, um, my colleague does more of the implementation. I picked out women's health, <laughs> mental health, all the you know all the disabilities. So. Um, I just, I know that sounds crazy, but that's what, that's what I do. That's what I do with health. Um, I do, for education, as we split it up, and one person does higher ed, another person does K to 12, and I do all, all the early ed and special ed. So you get, like, I just, you know, I want to wake up and feel passion, you know, and, and I love higher ed, but there's so much politics involved and the for-profit. Um, the ones that are, you know, are predatory, not not like Columbia, but, um, and I just and lobbyists were like, you know, were like snake oil salesmen. So um, I didn't have to work on that anymore. Um, I work on child care. I work on all the child welfare, foster care, substance abuse, TANF, homeless, abortion, adoption, LGBT, human rights, trafficking, tribal TANF. And then no one, because we're Alaska, wanted to work on any of the animal rights, so I took that. But we don't. So the first year, he got 100% in the human, um, on the uh, Humane Society, and we got in such trouble for that, for getting an award. Like, hey, you can't do that, you know, because they don't like um, the Iditarod, like sled dog racing. Mm -hmm. So then every year it's lower and lower. So I couldn't even get him on the puppy mill bill this year. I did get him on a gorilla. Don't use gorillas uh, for research, Bill. But you know, <laughs> so you know, legislative assistants have a lot of power. You know, I just want you know, as far as um, you know, you don't do anything without the member, but you have an option to go in there and and um, and argue your cause because I know him so well. I'm able to you know get to the chase pretty quick. I did, um, I have a memo I was going to show you so you know when you're, um, so kind of like what, let's say you're a legislative assistant and, or you're a person who's really interested in a bill and you call and you find out the LA's name and you say, so we'll use like the Social Work Reinvestment Act, which Senator, you know, Senator in a way has pushed for years, you know, and you call and I'm like, you know, you're like, oh, you really want to do this. So then, you get my attention, and I like it. You know, you send me information, I look it up, right? So then I go and I write um, 
what we call we do um, a co-sponsor memo. It's basically I say recommend yes, no, or I need more info, right? And we do this, and every office does this, you know, because you just you, it's really hard to. We have staff time, but a lot of offices don't have staff time, so he has to be takes these home and then he just reads them and so you get background this is a Dorothy Height this is what the social work and reinvestment act is and you say what it is and then at the very end we always say how does it um, how does it benefit Alaskans mm -hmm. see that that's every state you know it's like well you'll say like why do we want to do this and sometimes I have to really like stretch like the gorilla thing is a little hard but <laughs> but it's usually saying things like um, an Alaskan called. We're a small state, right? So two Alaskans call. It's like, whoa, you know. Once a week at our staff meeting, we tally. We have a mail person, and she report, reports on the mail. I mean, this is why it's important when you're doing social activism. She says how many, um, she says the top five. You know, and last week it was, of course, ACA, Obamacare, and everyone hates it, you know. And, it, um, you know, sometimes it's uh, the NCA, the, the um, security. She does the five, top five and um, the pros or cons of it, and she'll say how many letters or emails or phone calls. That is, like, one of the most important things in, in the personal offices, so for you as social workers, like, you know, you do have, you have the power, you know, most of you live in this area or where are you from? I'm from the Midwest. Okay. So do you know, um, do you know who your senator is? Uh, well, I'm actually registered in Missouri because that's where I've been okay. living last, so Claire McCaskill. Oh, yeah. Um, one that I've, I've met with her before. So. Mm -hmm. She's good. What about you, uh, well, I'm from Michigan, but I'm actually registered to vote here because I live here. So I haven't met with my senators. <laughs> it's hard. New York. It's so New York is hard. Well, it's one of the yeah. We love Senator Gillibrand. Um, she was just in Alaska. She is um, working on military sexual trauma abuse, and um, she has a bill. Uh, Senator McCaskill has a bill to keep it all within the. Um, the realm of the command, and then Gillibrand's is to take it out. Of course, civilian courts are amazing, and there's a lot of fighting going on. And my boss is on Gillibrand's um, bill. She's she's a fighter. You watch if you watch C-SPAN, you see her on the floor. You know, I was actually telling Stacey she should be a great um, graduation speaker. Yeah, well, that's good to know. Because she's she's an activist for the issues that you know that you care about. She's just so passionate. She's also really strategic, don't you think? Yes. She's runs, I mean, she's done some really smart things. Really smart. Yeah, yeah. so you're, you're fortunate to have her as a senator. Yeah, no, I, I do know my representative, though, because I live in 13th district, so Charlie Rangel is, like, oh, always yeah. out on the streets, yeah. like, during campaign season, uh -huh. so. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Dean? Um, I mean, I know that um, Rosa Delora was our, in Connecticut, in New Haven, um, to be honest with you, I forget the senator, but I'm originally from Puerto Rico, so we have a non-voting member of Congress, which is... It's like D.C. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, it still boggles my mind that D.C. and Puerto Rico are, like, have the same problem, because they couldn't be more different. Um, but... Um, which is interesting, and I'm hoping that when I'm in D.C., I will I'll visit his office. Um, but it, that's a whole other, like, like the political parties in Puerto Rico are completely different because we don't vote for president. It's a totally, it's all based around status. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, I forget who our, the senator is in Connecticut um, when Lou I was living Ball in. Paul or Murphy? Um, that's the two. I'm things. trying to remember which district we were in. I couldn't, yeah, I mean, I can't remember which one was the well, New Haven. Wasn't Dodd? Was Dodd? He was. He was. Yeah, he was. Yeah. Yeah. So I know it's a motion picture something. Yeah, I'm I know. pretty sure. Were you and Dodd's or the other guys? That's the thing is I, um, yeah. I don't remember. Well, remember well, but, but I know Deloro, Deloro was she a isn't. She's a champion for 
kids, mm -hmm. for women's Very issues. Too, yeah. Yeah. She is. She and is. she does a lot on the sort of on the in in New Haven specifically because obviously it's the it's the big urban center in her district but um, she does a lot of state level advocacy mm -hmm. as well mm -hmm. and so um, it's also well connected yeah which I didn't which mm -hmm. I didn't know I was yeah. um, it's sort of I couldn't understand I was like what is it with this woman and then you had made the connection mm -hmm. for me and um, because she's a um, she's an old um, she's from an old Italian family in um, in New Haven and I mean, New Haven is run by old Italian families, but right. um, and uh, but I just I didn't realize sort of how far mm. her stretch went, and I wish I had thought of that when I was still living in New Haven. You should see she's on the Sussure Caucus. It's only on the House side, so um, see if she's on there. Yeah. If she's not, you wanna. Yeah, and, and because I I lived in New Haven for so long, and technically that's my residency at the moment. But I'm sort of all over the place, so who knows where I'll end up. Well, the senator is, um, so Senator Begich is on the uh, Veterans Affairs, Homeland Security, and within Homeland Security, he chairs the Government Affairs. It's a very strange committee, but it's basically anything from, from um, CMS, like drugs, yeah, to, you know, it's mm -hmm. very, to, she's to, um, statehood for Washington DC it's a that committee um, and he's on commerce and he chairs the oceans committee which which makes sense because we have a lot of um, ocean and we have a lot of fish you know and um, he's on of course appropriations and then um, some of those subcommittees and he chairs the Democratic steering and outreach committee and um, that's a committee that um, the Democrats, um, every Wednesday, they bring in different groups. Like we're, do, we're actually doing a senior one in a couple of weeks. And they, the head of each of the national organizations come in. I love going to some of them because you see, like especially the women's one, because Cecile Richards is there and the head of NOW, and it's just amazing. So it would be like the head of ARP and some of the the unions not um, and they come and they um, they basically advise the senators and you know up to 20 senators will come in and out because the Senator Reed will open it and Senator Begich and then Reed leaves he has to gavel in you know and then they they come in and out and um, we had one on immigration we have LGBT um, we have one coming up on veterans and then there's others they just had a business one today when yeah, they just had a business one. They do do all different ones. So he also is um, chairs that one. So I mean, he's a freshman. I mean, he's really this is only his first term, but he's he's very effective and he works across party lines, which is just pretty unusual. Um, he's a likable guy. I mean, I'm totally biased. I'm a mm -hmm. I am a Democrat, true and true. So you're only getting one. You really are only getting one piece of the puzzle here. You know, and I am totally biased. I'm very upfront about it. I think we are the party that cares about people. You know, and if you look, and all I say, because we have interns this year, we have one intern, and she is um, a military mom. And so she <coughs> is um, a very strong Republican, because sometimes military, you know. And um, I just talked to her about it. I said, just look at the two party platforms. Just read the platforms. For you who say you care about the issues I care about, then, you know, like she said, I really want to work with you. you. You know, you care about, you know, kids and all. I said, okay, well, why don't you just, like, really start paying attention then? You know, because it's, it's people say there's not a difference, but there is a difference, you know.